Today, I'm gonna to be showing you guys how to build this. This is a full stack JS AI application. We can go in here, I can say, what can you do? And it's gonna tell me that it can do some stuff related to managing a food database. It can add some foods to the DB, search for a food. So if I'm like, okay, uh, search for steak. I can ask it to search for steak and then it can actually search a vector database for steak, give me this real component down, get a bunch of search results. I can also go in here and say, create a new food entry. And then it will be smart enough to go down here and create some UI for me to actually create a food. I'm gonna go ahead and let's just say this is going to be cherries. We're gonna go ahead and say that these are 40 calories and then this is a fruit. I'm gonna go ahead and head and hit create. It'll tell me it created it. And then if I want to say, uh, go up here and I want to search for uh, cherries, it'll now give me the information right here. So not the most advanced app in the world, but there is a lot of very useful stuff in here. And today I'm gonna show you how to build it. Now, first and foremost, there's a few prereqs. You need to have a GitHub account. You need to have an Upstash account. We're gonna be using them as our vector database provider. They have a really, really great offering on that. Then we have bun for our package manager. You need to have an open AI API key. Unfortunately, this is the only part that isn't completely free. Um, I wish this is one thing where I do, I hate having like a paid thing in here, but unfortunately for the open AI API key, and it's the most standard. So I wanted to use that. You do need to have an API key there, but you can get one for like $2 or whatever. So it's not the end of the world. And then finally, just you need to have a general understanding of modern web dev. This is not gonna be a T3 stack tutorial, which is what we're using. Not going over TRPC, not going over Tailwind, not going over React. That's not the point of today's video. If you wanna learn more about that, I highly recommend the videos by Theo, by Josh Tried Coding, by Coding with Antonio. All of them have phenomenal videos on this topic, which I highly, highly recommend. So the first concept I wanna talk about before we get into the code is going to be this new Vercel AI SDK. And we're gonna be leaning on this heavily to make this app work. Now, basically the way I would describe this is this is basically an ORM for LLMs. If you're at all familiar with Drizzle or Prisma, you know that generally speaking, the way they work is they sit between you and your database and give you a nice type safe way of interacting with it. And this does the same thing for the LLM. You can see right here, this is kind of like an ORM query where we're just calling stream text, but we can pass in any model we want the same way we can pass in any database we want to our ORM. We pass in our prompt, we get back a nice type safe answer and we're able to handle it that way. So it's really just a nice abstraction for us to really easily interact with our LLMs. And they also have a bunch of really cool stuff, which enables us to do the stuff earlier, which I demoed where we could go through and actually stream down new UI components to the end users. So all of this is really cool. We're going to talk about all of it today. Uh, in a lot of my previous tutorials, I've started with a finished code base and then gone from there. We're not actually doing that today. We're going to go through and implement this entire thing not quite from scratch because I did provide the UI as a template. I didn't want to spend a bunch of time going through and writing Tailwind and making cars. For this tutorial, that's just not worth anyone's time. But for all the AI stuff, all the packages, we're gonna be doing that from scratch. So make sure you get that repo cloned and let's get started. So to begin this project, we're gonna start with this AI tutorial shell. I have this link down below. It's a little GitHub project I made. Basically what I did is I went through and I created all the UI for what we're gonna be doing. I set up the project, set up the backend, all that stuff so that we can focus entirely on just making the AI itself and making the cool new features actually work. So what we're gonna go ahead and do is we're gonna go ahead and hit clone here. We're gonna go over to our terminal. I'm gonna go ahead and do a GH clone, paste in the repo. And I'm gonna go ahead, open this up in VS Code. And now that we have this opened up in VS Code, we need to go ahead and actually set up our AI SDK. So I'm gonna start here with the documentation for the AI SDK. I highly recommend going through this. Um, I highly recommend going through these on your own. These are really great docs and there's a lot of important info in here. We're gonna start in here. We're gonna go ahead into app router. I'm gonna go down here and just wanna copy this command. So I'm gonna grab this AI, AI SDK slash open AI in the Zod. So I'm just gonna copy paste this. I'm gonna go ahead and do bun add these two. I'm using bun because it's a really fast and really nice package manager. It's the one that I prefer these days. So we're gonna go ahead, install all these packages. And then now we need to go ahead and set up our environment variables. So I'm gonna go ahead in here and I'm going to create a new .env file. I'm gonna go ahead and add open AI API key. And now we need to actually go get this API key. So you're gonna go into your open AI dashboard, then go ahead down here to our API keys. We're gonna create a new API key. I'm just gonna call this tutorial key. I'm gonna go ahead and just create this. I'm now gonna go ahead and copy this. I'm gonna delete this before this goes live, so don't worry about leaking anything. Um, so we're gonna go ahead we're gonna go ahead and just save that. 
And now that that is saved, we can go ahead and actually instantiate our new OpenAI instance. So remember earlier, like I said, we have a couple different parts to this. We have the actual instance of our OpenAI model, which we then consume within the SDK. So we're going to go ahead in here. I'm going to go into my server directory and go in here and I'm going to create a new folder and we're going to call this um, open. We're going to call this AI. Go ahead in here and I'm going to do index.ts. I'm going to go ahead in here and I'm going to import create um, open AI from uh, AI SDK from at AI SDK slash open AI. We're going to go ahead and do export const open open AI equals create open AI. We're going to go ahead and say the API key is going to be our process.env.openAPI key. But actually what I want to do instead is I want to add in some type safety here and also some build time validation since we're using the T3 stack. So I'm going to go ahead into my env.js. I'm going to go ahead and add a new server environment variable. Environment variable. It's going to be open AI API key. Copilot knows. We're going to go down here and we're going to say open uh, AI API key. There we go. Now what we can do is we can delete this process. We can go here and we can just say at env slash env. Perfect. Okay, cool. So now that we've got this set up, we have our instance of OpenAI, and this instance has a bunch of stuff on it. So if we do OpenAI dot, we can see we have completion, we have embeddings, which we're going to talk about later in this video. Definitely stay tuned for that. There's a lot of really cool stuff in there. Um, we have chat, we have a bunch of different things, but what I'm actually going to do here is I'm going to do export const open AI model equals open AI. And then now we can pick one of the models. So there's a ton of different ones we can pick in here. I am going to use the new cool fun one GPT 4.0 because we can. And then, yeah, with all this set up, we have our open AI instance and we can actually show off how this works. So the first thing I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to go into my app directory here and we're just going to create a new folder called uh, demo. And then we're going to go ahead in here and I'm going to create a new page.tsx. We're going to have this be a server component just to make this really easy and simple. We're going to do export default function, export default async function page. And then we're going to go ahead in here. We're going to just do a return div and then we're going to say hello there. This is not the important part. We're not here for the page. We're rather we're going to be here for actually the server side logic where we can actually call this AI. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to import generate text from AI. Now this is one of those functions we can call to actually get some responses back from our LLM. So we're going to go ahead and here and we're going to say const res equals await generate text. And then in here we need to pass in a bunch of different stuff. So we're going to go ahead and first and foremost pass in our model which is going to be open AI model, which will import from our server slash AI. We're then going to go ahead and say prompt is going to be hello. What can you do? So then finally, we're going to go ahead console.log out our res so you can see what's on here and go back to my terminal. I'm going to do bun run at dev. We're going to open up localhost 3000. If you clone down the example repo, which I provided, you're going to see a bunch of different stuff in here. You'll have this create food component. You'll have this search food component, uh, some basic assistant messages. We're going to be filling in all of this very soon. But first, I'm going to start by going to slash demo. So when you go to slash demo, you're not going to see anything interesting. You're just going to see hello there. The really interesting stuff is actually going to happen in the terminal. So you're going to go ahead and see in here a bunch of different stuff from our generate text result. So right here we have the important piece, which is the text. So this is actually what the AI responded back with. So it responded with, hello, I'm here to answer a variety of tasks. I can do all this stuff. And really, as you can kind of see here, this is very much creating like an ORM instance, but for our AI model. So now we have this generate text function, wherever we want to use it, we can just prompt it and get some AI responses back. Now, this is cool. It's very cool, but there's a lot more that we can do with this and this could be used for some niche ca use cases in some apps, but it doesn't do a huge amount of super useful stuff. And if we want to go through and do something different, like I want to say, okay, uh, instead, what day is it? If I just want to ask it, what day is it? And I ask it and we go over here again, it's going to give us, I don't have real time capabilities to provide the current date. You can check the date with your device or whatever, whatever. The point is the LLM can't actually do real time stuff and it can't call our APIs. It can't do anything beyond just answering questions about the data it was trained on. So we're going to fix that. So we're going to go ahead and add to our generate text here. We're going to add in some tools. 
So this is going to be an object. The first tool we're gonna to go ahead and add in here is let's just say this will be a um, get day. So we're gonna create a get day function here. We're gonna give it a description. Now this description is actually really important because what this description will do is it will tell the AI what this function can actually do. So correctly, my copilot has figured out that we wanna get the day of the week. The next thing we're gonna add in are the parameters. And these parameters work a lot like normal function parameters, like you would in a normal JS function or anything else. They work like normal function parameters. And the way that you get those parameters is actually from the LLM and from the query. Now, in some other projects I'm working on, I have an example where we go through and I need to pull out some information from the LLM prompt. Say for example, it's a weight tracking app. So the user says that I just did X exercise, it will pull the exercise out of the prompt and then it can pass it in as a parameter. Now for this tool, we don't need any parameters, so I'm just gonna leave that blank. Then finally, we're gonna go ahead down here and add in an execute function. We're gonna do async. We're going to have our params here, which we don't actually need, so I'm just gonna leave that blank. And finally, we're gonna go ahead and do this and we're just gonna return Monday. Now, this is not actually correct because it's just gonna always return Monday. So what we can do is we can just do normal JavaScript logic here. And that's what's really, really cool about this and what I hope you guys try take away from this part of the tutorial is that within this execute function within our tools, we can do whatever we want. This is a normal JavaScript function that we define. So I'm gonna go ahead and just say const today equals new date. We're gonna go ahead and say const day equals uh, today.getday.toLocalString. And then we're gonna return the day. So now when we go into our actual prompt here and we pass in what day is it, this model now actually has access to a function called get day where it can get the day of the week. So let's go ahead and try this. So now when we go back into our terminal and we look at our tool call results, we're gonna see in here the text that it returned is empty. It didn't return any text, but the tool calls were actually fired. So it fired a tool call here to get day. And then we went ahead down in here and then we got our tool result, which was five. And the reason is just because the JavaScript date thing doesn't have the thing. Let's go ahead and make this a little bit nicer. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so let's do this. Let's scroll down here. And then there we go. Okay, so it's not perfect. It's not the day of the week, but you get the general picture. So it's gonna go ahead down in here and it's going to call this tool get day. It's going to give us this result of 524, 2024. And now our LLM has access to real capabilities, which is super, super helpful. So now all of this is really cool in the abstract vacuum of this like isolated backend function here. But how do we actually hook this up to our front end? Because like I said, this is not just a backend tutorial or a front end tutorial. This is a full stack AI tutorial. So how do we implement a UI for this? And how do we hook this up to a UI to where these tools can actually be useful? And what we're going to get to is instead of just returning some stuff and having it in some backend object that's kind of a pain to work with, no, we're gonna have UI return from this. So that'll be really cool and we'll talk about that later. But for now, let's go ahead back to our page.tsx and let's get this set up with generative UI. Now generative UI is the concept of, if I um, go back here, so generative UI is the concept of, if I go in here and I enter a prompt where I'm like, let me search for a food, I search that, it will give me this component back. It'll give me a real component that's generated from the backend that actually does the thing that I want it to do instead of just a little AI assistant message. So we're gonna go ahead in here and we're gonna implement all, and we're gonna implement the AI backing for this where I have this little food tracker instance where I can create a food and then I can search through my databases of foods, super basic stuff, but you can very quickly see how this could be ballooned into a real application. So let's begin by just doing the basics. So I'm gonna go back over to my code base here. I have these four things already added into my little container up here. I'm just gonna go ahead and delete those. And now we're gonna go ahead in here and we need to actually set up our, um, we need to actually set up our Gen UI instance. So we have this submit function. Whenever we submit the form, we just call console.log submit. We need to actually make this do something. So I'm gonna start, go back to the AI SDK documentation and we're gonna start here by copy pasting a bunch of code just to make our lives easier so we don't have to write a bunch of boilerplate. So what we're gonna do is I'm going to, within this generative user interface section, within the root components, I wanna copy paste this app slash actions.ts. And then we're gonna go back into our application. I'm gonna create a new file called actions.ts. And then I'm just gonna go ahead and paste all of that in here. And now this is gonna immediately throw some errors. So we're gonna start up here at the top I'm gonna go ahead and delete stock and flight. Then I'm gonna go down here real quick. We're going to go into our results. I'm gonna go ahead, uh, leave this for now. We'll leave this for now. Um, oh, whoops. 
this actually needs to be actions.tsx, I apologize. So we go ahead and do this, and now we're gonna go down into the tools section. I'm just gonna delete all of the tools in here because these are cool examples, but this is not what we want. We're going to add a type definition up here, and then where's the last thing that it's yelling at us about? And then we're gonna just go in here to this little text section. We're just gonna delete this. We're gonna, I wanna redo that with you guys here so that we can actually go over it. And uh, yeah, so now we have our little actions.tsx set up and there's a lot to talk about here. So let's just go down the file and explain all the different things in here and how they're actually working. So first and foremost, we have the interface server message. This is just the messages that will be returned by the server. The way you can kind of think about this working, and you're going to see this in code and in the UI in just a second here, is we have a list of messages here that can either be server messages or client messages. And these messages will then be displayed out in the end user's interface over here within our page.tsx. We're going to go right in here. We're going to display out all of those different messages in order. And basically the way this is working is if we go down here into our continue conversation function, we're going in and we're getting this history object from this get mutable AI state. Well, where does this get mutable AI state point to? It points down here to this uh, AI instance, which we're creating, which is the lifeblood of this generative AI section. So the way this works is we create a new AI instance and we're not going to get too deep into all of the nitty gritty on this, but the important thing to think of here is that it's going to have two different lists inside of it. It's going to have a list of the AI messages. It's going to have a list of the UI messages. And what we're really doing here in this continue conversation function, this action is we're just going through and we're actually adding in new messages to this chain. And every time we add a new message, we're going to recall the AI to actually get more messages out. So the way we start this is if we go in here to our continue conversation function, we're going to start up here with our history. So we get our mutable AI state. So this right here is going to give us a list of server messages. So the server messages is just everything from the AI. Then we can go ahead down here and we can call stream UI. Now stream UI is the big function, which does our generative UI stuff. This allows us to return react components and then actually stream those react components down into our app really, really cool. And I know that doesn't make a huge amount of sense, but when you see it in action, it will. So in the stream UI, just like in our generate text, we have to first define a model. So instead of using this guy, I'm going to go ahead and change this. And I'm going to say open AI model. So I want to just grab our model from that instance. Then we need to go ahead and define our messages. So instead of passing in a prompt, we're going to pass in a list of messages so that the AI has full context of the whole conversation. It'll know what I said a few messages ago and what I'm saying now. So we're gonna go ahead in here and we're going to grab the history. So from up here, and then we're gonna add in a new entry at the end here, which is going to be a role of user because it's going to be a user message. And then the content is just gonna be whatever they inputted. And the input just comes from this function up here. So this text function is called whenever there are no tools that can actually fulfill the user's request. We wanna go ahead and create a new list of messages that we're gonna to set to our AI state. So I'm gonna go ahead and say, const n messages equals, and then copilot gets it here. So we just want to grab history.get, but it actually got it wrong here. We don't want the role to be user. We want rules to be the role to be assistant. So we're going to pass in our role as assistant. Then we have our content in here. We have our new messages. Then finally, we want to just do done and messages. So we pass in our new messages. So actually I forgot one thing that we do need to do first. So we need to make sure that we are done. And if we are done, we're going to go ahead and here and do this. And then we're going to go ahead and do history that we inst uh, did up there dot done dot new messages. Pass this in here. And now once we've done this, it's going to go ahead and yell at us here. And the reason it's yelling at us is because this history dot done is expecting a list of server messages and server messages don't have have a slightly different type. Their role is a fixed enum instead of just string. So I'm just gonna go ahead and fix this type error by adding in this annotation and then moving back over here and adding in the array field here. So now that we've gone ahead and updated our history, the last thing we need to do is actually return something. Because remember, this is actually gonna return UI out onto our screen. So what we need to do is return instead of div content, I'm actually going to pass in a system message. And then the con the message is going to be on tent and then we're just going to do this and then now we have text handled now we go down here to the bottom this is just going to go ahead and return the new display of what the actual result was this display is a react node which we're actually returning here and that's the really nice part about this is we're actually returning react components from this ai so now let's go back into our page and hook up the client side version of this so i'm going to go up here 
I'm going to delete all these components. So now that we are back in here in our actual prompt, the first thing I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to paste in these two new functions, this use a UI state and this use actions. So I'm going to go ahead and add the import from AI slash RSC update the import from AI slash RSC. Now what I'm going to do in here is I'm going to actually add the type. So I'm going to do type of AI and this AI is going to come from dot slash actions. And then I'm going to go ahead in here and I'm going to say type of AI. Now, one thing we want to go ahead and do real quick before we finish up our front end UI there that I actually forgot about earlier is I want to add in the type definitions for this continue conversation so that on the front end, it knows what it's actually talking about when we call this. So I went ahead in here to our create AI instance, and this takes in a generic and we pass in our server messages, our client messages, but now we want to pass in the type of our continue conversation. So after that, just add in a little object here and then pass in continue conversation type of continue conversation. And now when we go back to our page.tsx and I do my use actions, it knows that I have this continue conversation function, which takes in an input and then returns a promise of a client message, which is really, really nice. So now that we've got all this stuff set up, let's go ahead and update our little submit function here. So once again, I'm going to go ahead and copy paste some stuff from the documentation just to cut down on boilerplate. We go ahead and delete this client message type def because we have our type defs up here. We're going to go ahead, spread out our current conversation, get it, and add the nano ID input up here. Oh, whoops. I'm going to go ahead and add the type of to this up here. Oh, whoops. Go ahead and add type up here. And then we're going to go ahead down in here and we're going to set our display object over here to not input, but rather we're going to set this to be a user message. And then we're going to say message is equal to the uh, prompt. Go ahead and close that off here. And then we're going to go back down over here to this. We're going to say const message equals await continue conversation. So I'm going to go ahead and switch this out to be prompt. We're going to go ahead down here, remove this type def because we don't need it. And then finally, we can go ahead and set our conversation again to just include the message now. Now, whenever we submit our form, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and update the conversation. And remember, this AI SDK instance has a list of has a list of messages and we're just adding to this list of messages. We're adding in the user's display message. Then we're going to go ahead and actually continue the conversation, which is going to call the AI to get the next piece of content, which will be the system message. So basically what this is user message, getting the system message, then setting the system message. It's just like normal react state, but a little more advanced. So now that we've done this, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this console.log. We need to actually display this out down here. And the way we actually display these out is incredibly simple. So I'm going to go ahead and paste this in. So we're going to go ahead and again, this is all slightly wrong. We're going to delete this. We're going to go ahead and say, uh, yeah, we can leave the div in here. The key can be message.id. But instead, I'm going to switch this to be message.display. And this display is a React node. It's going to be some React component that we uh, actually returned. And now that we've done this and I go back over to my app, we're going to get an error. And that is because I forgot to add the AI provider within our actual layout.tsx. So what we need to go ahead and do if we go back to our code is we need to go to our layout.tsx and then we just need to go back down in here and I just need to go ahead and add in an AI provider. We're going to import that from actions. Go ahead and do this. We're going to delete that, paste this down here. And now we have our AI instance, which will give full context across the app, which is super important since we're using these hooks. And now if we refresh this, we should have a working thing. So I'm just going to say, hi, what can you do? I'm going to go ahead and hit enter. It'll say, hello, I'm a virtual assistant, can help you with a variety of tasks, whatever, whatever. Let's go ahead and say, what is the best programming language? See if it can spark some ignorance. Um, yeah, okay, so it won't give me a real answer, but you know, that's valid. But the point is, this is now officially a GPT wrapper. You now have your very own wrapper wrapping OpenAI's GPT 4.0. Um, what model are you and what new things can you do let's just see what it says here gpt3 blah 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 is that even true i don't know i don't know what it's saying but the point is this works you have your own little ai instance and your own little chatbot but we can do a lot better than this we can make a lot more in here that can be a lot more interesting so let's go back in here to our little demo and let's add in some generative ui which is really where we start getting into the cool parts of this app
I'm going to go ahead down in here and we're going to go into our stream UI function here and I'm going to go ahead and add in some tools and this is where it's going to get fun. The first tool we're going to do is going to be add food and then we're going to go ahead, remember these from earlier, we're going to go ahead and add in a description, add a food to the user's database of foods. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and do this. We're gonna say our parameters. We're not gonna give it any parameters. We're just gonna add zod.object. It's just gonna be equal to nothing. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead in here and I actually changed this to add food just cause we can make it camel case, whatever. Um, so now that we've done all this, we can go ahead and have our parameters in here. There's no parameters. And now we need to go ahead and define our generate function. So we're gonna just say this is going to be async. Uh, I don't think that we actually need to await anything, uh, but we're just gonna go ahead in here and now it wants to just return some stuff. So we're just gonna make this super simple and we're just gonna return create food. That's it. And then we're gonna do the same thing here with search food. So we're gonna go ahead and say this, we're gonna say description, search for a food in the user's database of foods, parameters. Let's actually add in some parameters here. We'll have to change the UI slightly, but I think that's a valid use case here. So we're gonna go ahead and add in this name of string and then this search food. This will have a name in here, that's fine. We're just gonna go ahead and update this component real quick. So I'm gonna go ahead into my search food.tsx. We're gonna go ahead and add in a new parameter up here, which is gonna be name string. Then now we're gonna go ahead and say props. We're gonna say const name equals props. And then now that we've done this, we can go ahead and uh, set up our state here. We're gonna do this in a second here, but we'll just delete this for now. So then now within our use state, the default value is actually going to be, so now within our use state, the default value will be this name. Let's go ahead and hook this up to the input because we'll need to do that in a moment here anyway. We're gonna go ahead and down here, we're gonna say value equals search, on change equals set search. And there we go. Now we have our thing. And there we go. We have our little search set up, we have a default value, and we have an actual parameter from our little AI. Let's make this uh, look the same. And uh, yeah, I think that all looks good. So now let's go back over here to our little um, AI SDK. Go ahead and refresh this page. It's giving me an error because I didn't add the use client directive up here. That's my bad. So we're gonna go ahead and add in our use client, and there we go. So now let's go ahead and say, um, can I add some food? Now when we do this, it's gonna generate out the create food component. Or if I wanna go down here and I wanna say, um, uh, is um, steak in my foods DB? Go ahead and ask that. It's gonna go ahead and send us this down here. It's gonna have steak pre-populated because remember that parameter comes from our search query here and we get this back. So now let's go ahead back over here. And yeah, so now that this is all hooked up, we have full generative UI. Now the problem is this UI doesn't do anything. Let's fix that. So the next thing we need to talk about is going to be vector embeddings. Vector embeddings are super important for getting AI applications working and they have a lot of really useful features which we're gonna go over here. So first and foremost, what is a vector embedding? Uh, we're not gonna go deep into the math here and how all this stuff really works. Um, I'll try and link down below some really good examples that dive deep into that, but I am not a mathematician or an AI scientist. I'm just a guy who builds apps. So at a high level, all you need to know to build the app is that a vector embedding is basically just a higher dimensional vector representation of some word or some term. Say, for example, we have the word apple here and we convert it into a vector embedding that will turn into some gigantic vector that represents it in that space. There are different, um, there are a ton of different algorithms to generate these embeddings. They represent a bunch of different things. It's very complicated how all that works, but just at the end of the day, all you really need to know is we're converting a word into a vector. And what we can do with these vectors is we can do a bunch of different things. One of the most useful things we can do is we can search over these vectors. Imagine, for example, I had another term in here uh, called apple pie. I went ahead and I created a vector out of this. So it'd be slightly different from the apple vector. But what I can do is I can then compare these two vectors against each other and compare their distance in the higher dimensional space. You can take the cosine angle between them or maybe the distance between the two points or maybe the dot product. We'll talk about how those work later. Um, not the math behind them, but picking which uh, comparison you wanna use. I can compare these two vectors together and I imagine we had a hundred more of these in here. I can find the ones it's most similar to and we get a really quick, easy and clean search implementation out of that, which is super, super useful. And 
There are more things you can do with this too. This is also super useful for something called retrieval augmented generation, which is basically where whenever you make a query to your LLM, instead of just passing in the user's query, you actually feed it some extra context and data to make the response that it gives back more useful. Again, this is not gonna go too deep into how to do that. Uh, if you wanna see a dedicated video on RAG, definitely let me know down below and I can make one of those in the future. But for today, all we really need to, all we're really going to be worrying about today is going to be the search implementation. Like I said, there's more ways we can use these, but let's start with search. So in order to actually use these embeddings, we have to store them somewhere. And the way you want to do that is you want to put them into a vector database. There are a couple different solutions for this these days. Um, PG vector is a pretty popular one. But the one we're actually going to be using today is going to be um, Upstash's vector DB. That's why it was a prereq at the beginning of this video. So this video is actually sponsored by Upstash. And the reason why is because, well, I wanted them to. Um, I am currently using in Upstash's vector DB search for the new version of Insider Viz. You can see right here in my backend console, we've got about two and a half, um, we've got about 250,000 entries saved in here. And what we're saving in here is we're saving in all the companies and all the insiders so that we can quickly search over those in our app. And you can see here within the new beta version, this isn't live yet, it will be very soon, hopefully. Um, but if we go in here and I just search AAPL, it'll quickly search over all of those entries, that was 250,000 entries, and give me the right answer, it'll give me Apple. Or if I search up uh, Tesla, it'll give me the right answer here. It's a really quick and easy way for us to say to implement a search feature into our app. And we're also working on some stuff internally right now, which will utilize these in a much more advanced way and do some cool stuff, relating companies together, doing a bunch of different stuff. It's, it's gonna be really cool. And as such, we're gonna be using Upstash today to implement the vector database and a lot of the functionality for this little demo app we're building. So I'm gonna go in here to my Upstash console. I'm gonna go into the vector section here and we're gonna create a new index. Now, when we create the new index, we first gotta name it. So I'll just call this AI tutorial. I'm gonna just set the region to be Northern Virginia. And then this is where it gets kind of interesting. Now, remember, like I said earlier, whenever we have these vector embeddings, we have to convert the word into the embedding. We have to go from word to vector. Now, what's nice about using Upstash is you can pick any of these models and they'll handle the actual vector generation for you. This is actually how we're doing it inside our viz so that we don't have to worry about setting up our own open AI instance and doing all this stuff and making all that work. They'll just handle it for us. But actually for today, we're going to be doing it custom. And the reason why is I want to show you guys how this works end to end. So we're gonna be doing custom, which means that we have to pass the vector into Upstash. So the next thing we need to pick is going to be the dimensions of our vector. Now I'm gonna go back into the AI SDK docs. We're gonna go into getting started. We're gonna go into providers and models. We're gonna go down here into the um, open AI provider, then go down here into embedding models and look down here at the model capabilities. Now this is super important. We have three different models here, which are at our disposal. We can use embedding three large, embedding three small, or embedding ADA two. We're gonna use embedding ADA two because it's cheap and it just works. For this small of a data set in a tutorial, it's totally fine. So we're gonna go ahead and use this one. And the important piece here is it says the default dimensions are 1536. So we that's gonna be the number of dimensions that our vectors get. We wanna make sure that we tell Upstash the right number. So 1536 is correct. Then the next thing we need to pick is going to be the metric by which we compare our vectors. So we have cosine, Euclidean, and dot product. I'm just going to do cosine. It'll measure the angle between the vectors. It's good enough for right now. Um, but if you're going to use this in production, definitely do some research into the difference between all of these and figure out which one makes the most sense for your use case. So now that we've done all this, I'm going to go ahead and hit next. I'm going to do pay as you go, but you will be able to do this for free. Um, I just am already using this in prod and have a bigger account, so that's why. So we're gonna go ahead and do this. And now we're gonna go down here into JavaScript. Now we can go ahead and actually initialize our vector DB. So I'm gonna go ahead right here. I'm gonna copy this upstash vector. I'm gonna go back into the tutorial and I'm going to go ahead and do bun add upstash vector. Then I'm going to go, <clears throat> then we're gonna need to go back into our project here and we're going to need to hook up our environment variables. So I'm going to say um, upstash URL, and then I'm gonna say upstash token. So we need these two pieces right here. I'm gonna go into env.js. I'm gonna go ahead and say upstash uh, URL, and then I'm gonna go ahead and say upstash token. And then we're gonna go down here into the runtime env. We're gonna say um, upstash token and upstash URL, perfect. Now I'm gonna go back over into, now I'm gonna go back over here into the console. We're gonna grab this URL right here. 
Uh, like I said, I'm going to be deleting these ENVs before this goes live, so don't worry about me leaking anything. Uh, we're going to go ahead and do this. And then, yeah, we are all set and ready to actually use our Upstash instance. So before we do that, before we do our database work and hook it up to the application, I want to first show you guys how to create new vector embeddings with the AI SDK, which is a super useful function. So we're going to go back into our um, server slash AI file here. And then down here, we're going to go ahead and add in a new model. So we're going to say export const um, embeddings. We're going to go ahead and say export const open AI uh, embeddings model equals open AI dot embedding. And then we're gonna go ahead and pass in embedding ADA 02, perfect. So now we have access to an instance of the embedding model and we can go ahead and use that in the embed function. So to show how this works, we're just gonna go back into our little demo page here. I'm gonna go ahead and we've already done our gen text. So we're gonna delete this, I'm gonna delete all this. I'm gonna go ahead and add up here in, I'm gonna go ahead and say import embed from AI. I'm going to go ahead and say const res equals await embed. And then we need to pass in our model, which is going to be open AI embeddings model. And then we just need to pass in our value here, which will just be Apple. We'll just do that. And we're going to console.log out our res. I'm going to go ahead and run the dev server. I'm going to go back into our Arc browser here. I'm going to uh, jump back into the tutorial, refresh the demo page. And then once that is built, we will go back over here into our console and see our gigantic vector embedding. So this is our 1500 dimensional vector embedding representation of the word Apple. And now we need to actually save this into the database so we can search for it. Now, what's really nice about using um, Upstash for our vector database is they actually have something called metadata. So that means that we can attach more than just the name and the vector value to our actual um, instance so that we can save like the name, we can save some calorie data, all that stuff. We can use this like a normal database, which is really nice. So I'm gonna go ahead and here into my uh, server slash AI. I'm gonna go ahead and create a new file called upstash.ts. So we create our new little upstash.ts. I'm gonna go back into, we go back into the upstash console here into JavaScript. I'm just gonna copy this down here. So we're gonna go ahead and paste that in here. I'm gonna go ahead and replace this URL with env.upstash URL and this token with env.upstash token, beautiful. And now we're gonna go ahead and export upstash index. And there we go, we now have access to our index, we can save it, upsert, we can search over it, upsert to it, all that stuff is ready. But there's one more thing I wanna add in here, which is a little bit of type safety. And I'm, I'm a bit of a fiend for type safety, so we're gonna go ahead and do that. So I'm gonna go ahead in here and create a new type. We're gonna do export type food metadata metadata and that's going to be and that's going to have a couple different properties on it if you remember earlier within our little food instance here we have a name calories and a type so i'm going to go ahead and set my metadata value over here to be equal to that so we're going to have a name of string calories is going to be a number and our type is going to be a string i think actually i'm going to i'm going to give this a hard type so we're going to say fruit yep cool it's smart enough to remember what we did earlier. So we wanna set the type to be equal to this. So now that we've got this in here, we're gonna go ahead and add into this new index. We're going to say food metadata. And now that we've done that, all the metadata will be strongly typed from our database, which is super, super helpful. So let's go ahead and get this finished up. So I'm gonna go into my um, server directory here, into my API, into my routers, into this foods.ts router. I had this as part of the initial template. And now let's go ahead and do a um, create food endpoint. So we're just going to say this is going to be public procedure. We're not doing any authentication or anything like that for now. Dot input. Uh, this is trpc, by the way. Dot uh, z dot object. And then we're going to pass in the name. We're going to pass in the calories. And beautiful. So the GBT was smart enough to know all that. Then we're going to go ahead and say dot mutation. And there's going to be a sync. We're going to take in the input. And now we're gonna go ahead and save this food. So the first thing we need to do is create the embedding. So I'm gonna say const embedding equals await embed. And then we're gonna say model is equal to open AI embeddings model. And then our value is going to be our input.name. The next thing we need to do is we need to do await upstash index.upsert. 
So we're gonna go ahead and upstart in our little vector. So the first thing we need to do is pass in an ID. I'm just gonna say a uh, nano ID just to make that easier. I'm gonna go ahead real quick before we do that and import nano ID here so that we can generate an ID. Then I'm gonna go ahead and say ID is equal to nano ID. Then for our vector, that is going to be equal to the embedding. And then for our metadata, we're gonna go ahead and pass in the name, the calories and the type, beautiful. And what's really nice here is you can see this metadata knows what it needs to be. Actually, let's go ahead and refactor that real quick. So we'll put const ID equals nano ID, put that in here, and then we'll return our ID. Okay, cool. So now we have our mutation to create our food. Now the next thing we need to do is create the mutation to act is create the mutation to actually search for our food. So I'm gonna go ahead in here and I'm going to say um, search food. And that's going to be a public procedure dot input z dot object. Um, we're going to just say query is z dot string dot and I'm actually going to make this mutation because I don't want it to just always run. I find it's easier to implement like debouncing this way. Okay, perfect. So the first thing we need to do once again is to well, let's add a comma here. And then the first thing we need to do is we need to go ahead and create our embedding. So we're going to say const embedding equals await embed. And then we're going to go ahead and say whoops model is the embeddings model and then our value is the input.query then we need to go ahead and say const results equals await up stash index dot query then our payload right here is going to be the vector which will be embedding the top k which is the number that we want to get back is going to be 10 and then we're going to want to say include metadata is true because we want to get more information about this. So you can then see right here, we'll get a list of query results with food metadata attached and go ahead and just return results.map. Now I'm going to go ahead and transform the shape of this just to be easier to work with on the front end. So I'm just going to say const found foods and then we're going to give this a type of ID string and then yep, give them that correct type and it's going to be equal to an array. We'll have this be an array of these. Then I'm just gonna go on a for loop through these. And then I'm gonna say if results, this is really just to get rid of any undefines and make it easier to work with on the front end. And we'll do foundfoods.push, yep. And then finally, we'll just close off this guy. Oh, and then we know it's a string because we created. So we'll just say as string. So now that we've done this, we can go ahead down here and just do return found foods and we're good. Those are the only two endpoints we'll need on the back end to actually get all this stuff working. So now let's hook this up to the front end and get an actual application working. So let's go back into our create food component. So we're gonna go in here and I'm gonna go up to the top and we're gonna go ahead and say const um, create food mutation equals um, API. And then make sure you import this from trpc slash react, not trpc slash server. We're going to do api.foods.createFood.useMutation. Then I'm going to go ahead and add an on success here. And then that's just going to say, um, we're just going to do an alert. This is not the nicest app in the world, but we'll just do food created. And then we're going to go ahead down in here. And I'm going to go ahead and hook up the state for this. So we're going to say const. Uh, yeah, I'll just let, <laughs> just let GPT do this for me. No, we don't want this. Uh, we're gonna go ahead right down here, hit that. And then I'm gonna go down here into the actual thing. I probably should have put this in the template, that's my bad, but um, this should be very quick and trivial to add in. Value equals calories on change, uh, calories is zero. Yep, select value, we want on, on value change, we wanna say uh, V and then we wanna do set type V. Brilliant. So now that we've got the state hooked up for our app, we're going to go ahead down here and do our submit function. So I'm going to say const submit equals a uh, on submit equals this. And then we're literally just going to do create food mutation dot mutate. And then uh, we'll just do as any. Whoops. We need to give type a type here. So I'm just going to say any. Oh, crap. Because we need to like, we need to type smack it a little bit. Um, here, you know what? Let's just go ahead and uh, yoink this. Let's go ahead and just put this here. There we go. And then the default will be fruit. And then if we scroll down here, it will be mad at us again, but this is where we can do as any. Oh, come on. All right, fine. 
there are you happy okay i apologize but like whatever it, it works we, we we get it fixed it's you know it functions um i might actually push a, an update up to this template so that you just don't have to do any of this during the actual tutorial because this is kind of stupid um but yeah, anyways, now that we've done this, the last thing we need to do down here is actually add in our submit button. So we're gonna go ahead and add in a new div here. I'm just going to do button. We'll import that from UI button. We'll go ahead and say create. We're gonna say on click is submit. We're gonna go ahead and say disabled equals um, create food mutation dot is pending, is pending. And now we should have a functional food creator in, on our hands. So let's go back into our app. Let's go ahead back in here and let's go ahead and say, create a new food. And now it'll give me my create food. Let's go ahead and add in steak. Let's say there's like 700 calories. And then let's say that this is gonna be meat. Let's hit create. It's created our new food. And if we go back into our Upstash dashboard right here, I'm gonna go into my data browser and refresh and we'll have a new entry in here. You can see right here, we have, this is the vector representation of steak. We have our name, we have our calories, we have our type, and now we can use this in our application to actually search. So let's go, uh, so let's real quick, let's go back in here. Let's add a few more. Let's add an apple, 100, and then this is a fruit. Uh, let's go ahead and add in another one, which will be a peach, which is like, 80 calories, and that's also a fruit. I don't know, my calories are right here, just go with me. Um, and yeah, okay, cool. So we've got like three entries in there, should be good enough. Uh, let's go ahead and do search now. So let's go back in here and let's go to search food. Let's go ahead and this should be pretty easy. Let's do const um, search for food, search food mutation equals um, search food mutation, which is going to be API. Again, make sure it comes from react.foods.searchfood.useMutation. And then I'm going to go ahead and say on success, we need to go ahead and create our search results state here. So I'm going to go down here. Um, you can see I have down here, I have these guys. So I'm going to go ahead and down here, I'm going to copy this type again, just because we have to do this. I really should have made this like a generic type somewhere in the app, but you live and learn, <laughs> whatever. Um, okay, so we'll just say foods, set foods, and then we'll say use state. We're gonna go ahead and make this an empty array. We're gonna add a type def in here. So they're gonna have a name, calories, and then they're gonna have type, and then they're also gonna have an ID of string. So now that we've done that piece here, oh, whoops, need to add in the array definition. In here on success, we will get some data down and then we want to go ahead and just set our foods to be equal to the data. That should work quite nicely. And with that, all we need to do is implement the debounce for our food results so that we don't just spam the database. Um, we just do it after the user stops typing. It's a very important thing to usually have. So the first thing I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to create a new ref for the timeout. Go ahead and import all this. Then we are going to add in a use effect. Actually, let's move these two down here. We go ahead and add in a use effect right here so that every time we update our search up here, we go ahead and actually rerun this. So I'm going to say if search is not equal to empty. So if we don't have an empty search. We want to go ahead in here and we want to actually run the search. So I'm going to go ahead and say timeout ref dot current equals set timeout. So we want to wait like a couple hundred milliseconds to actually run this search so that we don't just overload our back end every single time we keep press. So I'm going to go ahead and say this will run every, um, we'll do 500 milliseconds. We want to go ahead and do search for food mutation dot mutate, and then we'll pass in the query. Whoops, I spelled mutation wrong. I just fixed that. Um, so what we want to do is we want to do search for food mutation dot mutate, and then we want to go ahead and pass in our query, which is search. And then, uh, oh, I forgot. Another thing we need to add in here is if timeout ref current, we want to clear our timeout so that we destroy the previous timeout that we had so that we don't spam our search, which is the whole point of this. Then finally, in the else case here, I want to go ahead and say, um, first and foremost, we want to clear our timeout. And then I want to go ahead and set um, set foods to be an empty array. I don't want that. 
And then finally, we just need to add in our dependency array, which is just going to be search. And then also, sure, search for food mutation. Oh, wait, we need to pass in our results here because I didn't have those dynamic. So we're going to go right here. I'm going to go up here, and I'm going to say foods.map. We're going to pass in the food. We're going to go ahead and do this. Then this is going to return some JSX, which is going to be this. So I'm just going to delete that, paste it in here. Now this needs to have a key to it. So we're going to say key is food.id. Then we're going to go ahead and say the this is actually going to be uh, food.name. Then this is going to be food.calories. And then this is going to be food.type. And with that, uh, and also deleting this guy, of course, we should have a functional app here. Let's go back into this and let's say um, search for peaches. Go ahead and search for peaches. It'll pass in peaches by default. And there we have it. We have all of this stuff in here. I have a bug in this. Why does that say fruit? Give me one moment. It appears that in my copy pasting, I forgot to actually change the name in these. Whoops. So we're gonna go ahead real quick here. One more last thing. So we're gonna go ahead and change this to be meat. Let's say this to be a uh, pastry. I'm gonna go ahead and add this, set this to be uh, dairy. And we're gonna set this to be up. And now, now it works. Now we have our very, it's basic, but it's a functional AI app. And you can see how this could be expanded and more things you could do with this. But yeah, that's how this sort of works. We now are able to say like, what can you do? And then I'll go ahead down here and I'll say, help you variety of tasks related to food, getting all that stuff. And I'm gonna go ahead and say, create new food. And go ahead down here. We can go ahead and say a uh, burger. We'll say this is like a thousand calories. Um, that's other. We'll go ahead and say create and then um, search for burger. We go ahead down in here and we will get our results. And if I change this to be like steak, it'll update our results. Or maybe if we wanted to add in something new, see what's related to like oranges, see what that it's most related to peach and then apple and then burger and then steak seems pretty reasonable to me. And yeah, that's it. That's our little application here and it should be working. If you guys enjoyed this, make sure you leave a like and subscribe. Um, I will have more content on this coming in the future. This code base, the final completed version of it will also be linked down below if you want to check any of your work and go back and forth. And uh, yeah, I would love to see the things that you guys come up with here. I think, um, you know, I think this user interface definitely needs some work, but this sort of style of app and the things we can do with these AIs is really freaking cool. So uh, yeah, hope you guys enjoyed and I will talk to you soon.